We're finally moving on from Newton's first law, which says an object at rest stays at rest, until acted upon by an unbalanced force. Object in motion stays in motion, straight line constant speed, until acted upon by an unbalanced force. Newton's second law, A is equal to F over M, right? We're moving on finally to Newton's third law. Does anybody want to know what Newton's third law says? You've heard this before. You've heard it a million times before, actually. Yeah, yeah. For every action, there's an, an equal and opposite reaction. I don't actually like that way of stating Newton's third law. It's correct. If you stated it that way on a test, I would mark it correct because it is correct. But it leads to a misconception. Here's the misconception it leads to. I have two cars colliding. I'm only going to draw one of them. It's an oddly shaped minivan. That minivan collides with another car. There's a force acting on this minivan. What is it? Which way does it act, I should say? Okay, you got another car going this way. Which way does the force acting on the minivan act? To the left. I'm going to call that... I'm going to call that F1, acting to the left. Does that make sense? What's the equal and opposite force? Remember, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. That's going to be a force to the, to the right. Let's call that F2. Tell me when to stop drawing F2. Yeah. So we're going to draw F2 like that, right? Tell me what the net force is now. Zero? There is the misconception. If we, say, if we say for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, that often leads us to the conclusion that we just drew, and that is that there's, a, there's, there's zero net force. Think about that. If Newton's third law always applies, if it always applies, and we've done this correct, then the net force is always zero. That means that if this minivan is driving down the highway and collides with something, and there's no net force acting on it, then this minivan is going to keep going at a constant speed in a straight line. That doesn't happen. So what's the problem? Newton's third law isn't the thing that's wrong. The way we interpreted Newton's third law was the thing that was wrong. F2 is equal and opposite to F1, but F2 doesn't act on the first van. F2 acts on the second vehicle. I'm not sure what kind of vehicle that is. It's acting on the second vehicle. Now, the net force is clearly not zero now because we have two different objects. You have, for every action, an equal and opposite reaction, but the action force is on one object and the reaction force is always on a different object. So, the way that I like to state Newton's third law in order to not get mixed up like we just did is the following way. If object A applies a force on object B, then object B will apply an equal and opposite force on object A. That says the same thing, but it clarifies for us that we're dealing with two separate objects, always dealing with two separate objects. If we weren't, then the net force would always be zero. And that can't happen. Otherwise, things that were at rest would always remain at rest, and things in motion would always stay in motion. There would never be an unbalanced force. The forces would always be the same, and things would always just keep doing what they're doing. We will stock, still talk about action-reaction forces, however. In fact, we're going to provide a few specific examples of action-reaction forces. In other words, the action force is the force that A applies on B. The reaction force is the force that B applies on A. For example, you're pushing on a wall with your hand. What's the action force there? It's the hand on the wall. So your hand is pushing on the wall. What's the reaction force? The wall pushes on your hand. Here's another one. Your foot kicks a soccer ball. What's the action force? Your foot on the soccer ball, right? The soccer ball doesn't go anywhere if there's no net force. Think about that, right? If, 
if we define Newton's first, sorry, Newton's third law like we did originally, for every action is an equal opposite reaction, and we had the same misconception as we had when we were interpreting that, we would say that there's no net force acting on the soccer ball. The ball wouldn't go anywhere. But the reality is there is a net force acting on the soccer ball. I apply a force on the soccer ball. There is an equal and opposite force, but it's not on the soccer ball. The equal and opposite force is on my foot. So the action force is the foot on the ball, and the reaction force is the ball on my foot. You ever get up in the middle of the night because you've had three glasses of water before bed and you got to pee and you walk to the bathroom, but it's kind of dark and you stub your toe on the corner of the bed? You ever do that? Why does it hurt? Why does it hurt? It is not because you kicked the bed. You kicking the bed doesn't hurt you. You might break the bed. You might break the bed or dent the bed or something. But that doesn't make it hurt. What hurts is that the bed kicks you back with an equal and opposite force. If you kick the bed with a force of 100 newtons, then the bed says, I'm not going to take that. I'm going to kick you back with the exact same force of 100 newtons. Your object A, the bed's object B. If you apply a force on object B, then object B will apply an equal and opposite force back on you. Here's another one. Your hand throws a ball. So you, you throw a ball. What's the action force here? Yeah. The hand on the ball. What's the reaction force? The ball on the hand. Now, if I throw a ball, odds are that ball is going to weigh less than me, right? I have a mass of about 70 kilograms. Odds are I'm not going to be throwing a ball that has a mass of... 70 kilograms. That'd be a pretty heavy ball. So if I throw the ball forward, and let's assume that I'm on ice here in a frictionless environment. If I throw the ball forward, I will go backwards. I apply a force on the ball forward. The ball applies an equal and opposite force on me backwards. Do I go as fast as the ball goes? Dumb? Do I go, do I go backwards as fast as the ball goes forwards? No, you're correct. I don't. But why not? The forces are equal and opposite. If I apply a force on the ball, and the ball applies the exact same force back on me, why don't I go back with the same speed as the ball does? Because there's more forces. No, not because there's more forces. Yeah, there could be friction. Sure, there could be friction. But we're in a frictionless environment here. Let's say it's ice or whatever. Why do I not go back as fast? Because I'm heavier, right? Because I'm heavier. Now, if we say A is equal to F over M, and force is the same, that's great. But the acceleration of me will be less because my mass is dramatically more. Does that make sense? i got one more question for you. If I throw a ball at that window, and the ball bounces off of that window, the ball applies a force on the glass. Does the glass apply an equal and opposite force back on the ball if the ball bounces off? Yes. Yes, it does. The ball applies a force of 20 newtons on the glass. The glass applies an equal and opposite force of 20 newtons on the ball. We agree there? No tricks. That's, I'm not trying to trick you here. That's correct. Okay, what about this, though? What about this? If I throw a ball at the glass, or let's say I throw a rock at the glass, and the glass breaks, the rock applied a force on the glass. The glass applied a force back on the rock as well, right? The, the rock probably slowed down as it went through the glass. So the, the glass applied a force back on the rock. But was it equal and opposite? Was the force of the glass on the rock as big as the, the rock on the glass? Kelvin? Yes. Yeah, you're right. Good. I heard people saying no. I called on Kelton because I knew Kelton was right there. I heard what he said. It is absolutely the same force. So how do we explain that? How come the glass breaks and the rock keeps going if the forces were equal and opposite? Well, let me give you some pretend numbers here. Let's say the rock applies a force on the glass of 10 newtons. That's all that it applied because that's what was required to break the glass. Let's say the breaking force of the glass is 10 newtons. I apply, let's say I apply a force of 8. The rock bounces back, right? Because the, the, the glass doesn't break. Glass, 
Rock applies a force on the glass of 8. Glass applies a force back of 8. But if the breaking force is 10, and I throw a rock at the glass, the most the force that the rock can apply on the grass, glass is 10. doesn't matter how hard I throw it. If I throw it as hard as I possibly can, the force that the rock applies on the glass is 10, whatever it required to break it. Now, the glass applies an equal and opposite force back on the rock of 10. Why did the rock keep going? Because the rock had too much inertia, right? The rock has more mass, and 10 newtons is enough to maybe slow down the rock, but it's not enough to stop it or cause it to bounce back. Why does the glass break and the rock not break? It's a simple answer to that question. Yeah? The glass spring work and it's um, more um, fragile? Yeah. The glass isn't as strong, right? It's weaker. 10 newtons is enough to break the glass, but 10 newtons isn't enough to break the rock. It doesn't mean it's not an equal and opposite force. It just means the effect of that force is different. How about this one? Smart car. Smart car collides with a semi-truck. Does not end well for the smart car driver. Smart car applies a force on the semi-truck. How does the force of the semi-truck on the smart car compare to the force of the smart car on the semi-truck? The force is bigger on the semi-truck? Or the force is bigger on the smart car? They're both moving. Mm, sure. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Yep. Yeah. The semi has more inertia. Yes, it would, because it's way heavier, for sure. But how do the forces compare? Yeah? They're equal and opposite. Smart car applies a force on the semi-truck. Semi-truck applies an equal and opposite force on the smart car. It's always equal and opposite. There are no exceptions. So why does the smart car get destroyed and the semi-truck not get destroyed? Yeah. The semi-truck had way more inertia, and the semi-truck... Um, has way, uh, essentially has way less ability to be destroyed than a smart car, right? It's easier to destroy a smart car than it is a semi-truck. It requires less force to destroy a smart car than a semi-truck. Does that make sense? Yeah. 